All right, welcome everyone. My name's Kashing and I'm a PGY1 pharmacy resident. And today we're gonna talk about uh, tick-borne illness. My title is TikTok, don't let the ticks rock. I just wanna, uh, before I start going through, I just want to take a moment to thank my content experts, Megan Wimmer and Brian Voss for giving me the right guidance to producing this amazing presentation today. So here are my objectives for this presentation. It is to identify when to suspect tick-borne illness, define diagnostic criteria for tick-borne illness and tools for diagnosis, discuss treatment options for the most common tick-borne illnesses in the Midwest. So it's time to start. First of all, what is a tick? According to Brian Buss, this is what he thinks of when we talk about ticks. This is Harry the Haunted Hunter from the movie Beetlejuice. I think he thinks of this character because of the proportionally small head and the proportionally large body, which may resemble a tick. Now that I've got your attention, here is what the CDC defines ticks as. They are eight-legged parasitic arachnids, part of the mite superorder parasitiforms. They can measure to be approximately three to five millimeters in length. They go through four life stages. They start off as eggs, which primarily occur during spring. And then after a year of the next spring, they develop into larva. The year following that, they develop into nymph. Humans are infected through the, the bites of these immature ticks called nymphs. They are so tiny and typically less than two millimeters making them difficult to see and the perfect parasite. After a few months during winter, they become adults. It may take up to three years for a tick to re reach adulthood. And then lastly, the cycle repeats again. If you notice, the life cycle of ticks typically grow during the spring season with adulthood achieved by winter. This graph is showing you that the peak season for transmitted tick-borne illness is from April to October months. However, know that you can be infected all year round. Now let's talk about how tick-borne illnesses are transmitted. They live by feeding on the blood of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. They must eat blood at every stage to survive and will take approximately 10 minutes to two hours to locate a feeding spot. When feeding, the tick will inject its feeding tube into the skin and secrete a cement-like substance to remain attached to uh, the skin or essentially their meal. The tick will slowly suck the blood for several days. Small amounts of the tick saliva may enter the skin of the host during this process. This is where transmission of an organism may occur both to the host and to the tick. And then after feeding, the tick will fall off and prepare for its next life uh, stage to transmit it and transmit the acquired pathogens from host to host. And then here is a photo to show you how it truly looks on your skin when they feed. A tick-borne illness is an infection or a disease transmitted by a tick bite. Possible pathogens include anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Borrelia, and then Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, tularemia, and many, many more. Their prospective bacteria is listed alongside them. For this presentation, we'll focus on Lyme disease and anaplasma and babesios babesiosis, which is commonly prevalent in the Midwest and Northeastern part of the US. Before we start talking about the, those three tick-borne illnesses, let's talk about the tick that causes it. The specific type of tick that causes transmission is found primarily in the black legged tick. The scientific name for this tick is the Exodes scapularis. A common name is also known as the deer tick. The average lifespan is two years and it's primarily um, located in central and eastern uh, part of the US. Its diet is it's a carnivore. Humans are incidental hosts to the pathogen. Typically, a tick must latch on for about 36 to 72 hours for there to be a risk for infection. The most common bacteria transmitted with the deer tick are Anaplasma phagocytophilum, Babesia microti, and Borrelia burgdorferi. 
know that you can be co-infected with two of the different bacteria or even all three. If you are infected with more than one, uh, prognosis is typically poor. And then here is um, a table of uh, pictures to display in the US where each tick-borne illness is prevalent in the US. Notice that all of these tick-borne illnesses will be talk, uh, talked about today are primarily found in the Midwest and Northeastern part of the US. So let's break this apart by starting with one tick-borne illness, Lyme disease. In 2019, the CDC has these reported cases of Lyme disease, which have been more prevalent in the Northeastern part and central of US. Primarily, this is primarily uh, found in Minnesota and Wisconsin of the Midwest. Lyme disease was recognized in the US as a new form of inflammatory arthritis in 1975, primarily caused by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. It was at first identified in six patients in the northern part of Minnesota and northern part of Wisconsin, who all presented with fever in 1990s. And then the timing was also consistent with uh, host seeking activity of the specific tick, the deer tick. In 2017, there were over 40,000 confirmed cases of Lyme disease reported to the CDC. Um, this number is actually likely eight to 10 times more than reported. Over 5 million diagnostic tests performed annually, and then 40, 476,000 Americans diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease. However, the, this number may likely be an overestimate of the actual infection due to the presumption of Lyme disease and unconfirmed diagnosis. Overall, patients at risk in contracting Lyme disease included immunocompromised patients um, or people who live near or spend time in known tick habitats. Lyme disease is primarily caused by the bacteria burgdorferi, Borrelia burgdorferi. So let's dive deeper into understanding what this bacteria is. So identified by Dr. Willie Burgdorfer in 1977, he was found to produce a skin rash resembling urethema migrans, which we'll talk about later, um, when injected into rabbits. It is a spirochete bacteria. What makes it unique is that Bur Borrelia burgdorferi has no classically defined virulence factors, suspecting that this bug um, did not evolve to be disease causing. However, it does present a lipoprotein, which has been shown to trigger components of the innate immune system. The motility of these spirochetes also allow it to swim and penetrate really well through host tissues and travel throughout the host. They also have surface protein that remodel themselves in different host environments, which helps the bacteria survive in the initial attack of the innate immune system. All of this is the reason why Borrelia burgdorferi is difficult to treat. All right, closing the door to Borrelia burgdorferi for now, we've got anaplasmosis. I just wanna introduce anaplasmosis so we have a little understanding of it. It is also regionalized to the Midwest and Northeastern part of the US. Notice that this is similar to Lyme disease, um, the Lyme disease uh, graph too. In 2019, there were 5,655 cases in the US. It was, um, the typical bug is Anaplasma phagocytophilum. It is a gram negative intracellular bacterium and genetically related to Rickettsia and Ehrlichia. This bacteria is also transmitted by the deer tick. It was first discovered in 1932 in, a Scot in Scotland and dismissed until it was further discovered in horses in 1969. There were more cases found in dogs in the 1970s and 1980s, which then led to the full discovery of anaplasmosis in the 1990s. This is an intracellular bacteria that infects the host neutrophils. Those pictures are displaying pictures of neutrophils. They infect the host by residing in the uh, vacuoles of the neutrophils, which is one of the cell's organelles. Living in this vacuole within the neutrophil will give the bacteria stability and time to replicate. They will essentially hijack the neutrophil and burst to infect more neutrophils. Now let's introduce the third tick-borne illness, which is babesiosis. This is again a graph represented by the cases seen in 2019 collected by the CDC. 
They are also primarily found in the northeastern and upper Midwest part of the US. In 2019, there were a total of 2,418 cases in the US. 88% of those cases were reported in either Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, in the um, upper Northeast, and then primarily in Minnesota and Wisconsin. This is caused by the bacteria Babesia microti. And then this bacteria is a protozoan parasite, which is most known to be the common cause of babesiosis. So let's talk about Babesia microti. It was first discovered in 1969 in Massachusetts. Um, this is transmitted by the deer tick and invades red blood cells and replicates until red blood cells rupture to release parasites. These parasites will invade the new red blood cell, replicate, and cause cell lysis. So you can see on the pictures there to the right that there's the arrow that points to them. They've got a little kind of bench structure with two bulbs um, inside those cells. This mechanism of um, causing cell lysis is important when we start talking about side effects soon. All right, this is a lot of information to launch. Let's pause for a summary quick. So throughout this presentation, we will be building on this table to help compare and contrast the main points. First, we just discussed the pathogen and the unique characteristics of each tick-borne illness. Lyme disease is caused by the spirochete bacteria called Borrelia or Dorferi. Anaplasma uh, or anaplasmosis is caused by the intracellular bacteria Anaplasma phagocytophilum. And babesiosis is caused by the protozoan parasitic pathogen called Babesia microti. Before we move on, I think it's a good time to pause for an assessment question. So the first question I have here is when is it the peak season for acquiring tick-borne illness? Is it April through October, November through December, January to March, or all year round? And I see a lot of A's. And that is the right answer, a April to October months. To reference again, this is um, kind of like where we would see typically the peak season for ticks is from April through October. And it's going to approach April pretty soon, so you, um, it's a good thing that um, we should be watching out for ticks if you're going to some, um, have some tick places. So here is the first objective. We are going to start talking um, about what when to identify and suspect tick-borne illness utilizing symptoms and clinical presentations as our guide. I'll discuss each Lyme, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis with their unique clinical presentations soon. Before we start talking about each individual, let's talk about the common side effects across all three pathogen or all three tick-borne diseases. Across all three, we've got typical flu-like symptoms, which include fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This will typically occur between days zero to 30 after a tick bite or known tick exposure is known. Now you're probably wondering, how do I know if this is COVID or is it a tick-borne illness? Let's talk about the symptoms specific to each of these. Each tick-borne disease will have their own symptoms characteristic, characteristic to their disease. And we'll discuss this further to compare the differences. So let's start with Lyme disease. Beyond the typical flu-like symptoms, some hallmark symptoms of Lyme disease are urethema migraines, which is a rash that looks like, um, that typically presents after a tick bite in about 60 to 80% of patients. And then we also have here severe joint pain and swelling, typically in the knees and large joints. This occurs in about 27 um, to 30% of patients. Do note that everyone will not everyone will present with urethema migraines or muscle and joint aches. A patient may be infected with Lyme disease without any clinical presentations of these hallmark symptoms. If left untreated, it may develop into Lyme carditis, Lyme arthritis, or neurologic Lyme disease. Okay, so urethema migraines rash may develop in many different ways. You saw one photo, but here are some more photos to help you visualize how they will look. 
We've got the classic target rash, and then the rash with an expanding rash with a central cross, an expanding rash with the nodule, a rash with mul uh, multiple rashes that are a circular shape, and then an oval red rash, which can be um, confused with cellulitis. And then also a rash that can be red or blue in appearance, typically found behind the knee. Overall, the main point of this, this slide is to show that urethema migraines may present in many different ways. You won't always have the classic target appearance look to the rash, making diagnosis difficult to achieve. This concludes the signs and symptoms for Lyme disease. Um, before we start talking about the next uh, tick-borne disease, anaplasmosis. So for anaplasmosis, you'll still get those common flu-like symptoms that will occur within zero to 30 days. Um, some other symptoms specific to anaplasmosis are thrombocytopenia, which occurs in about 75% of patients. This is a, this essentially the destruction of platelets leading to a risk of bleeding. Leukopenia, a low level of white blood cells, um, in, is a low level of white blood cells, which can interfere with the ability to fight infection. And leukopenia is important because um, how mat anaplasma phagocytophilum works is that the mechanism of it is it lives inside a neutrophil by living in the cell vacuoles until they replicate enough to burst open and infect more. The cell lysis or the bursting of the neutrophils is what essentially um, is, causes leukopenia. Lastly, we've got elevated ferritin as a hallmark symptom too of anaplasmosis, high levels of ferritin can damage your joints, heart, liver, and pancreas. This overall concludes the uh, main clinical presentations for anaplasmosis. And we've got one more tick-borne uh, disease to talk about, which is babesiosis. The common symptoms, again, are flu-like symptoms. However, in babesiosis, flu-like symptoms um, typically don't occur as often as the other two diseases. Most patients um, with babesiosis are asymptomatic from the flu-like symptoms. If they do develop, they do have um, hallmark symptoms of thrombocytopenia, again, similar to anaplasmosis, which is the destruction of platelets, and then hemolytic anemia, which is the disorder in which red blood cells are destroyed faster than they can be made. To remind you, Babesia microti will invade red blood cells and replicate until red blood cells rupture and release, um, release these parasites. This is the main cause to the clinical manifestation of hemolytic anemia, making this another a hallmark symptom of babesiosis. Overall, when left untreated, um, babesiosis may develop into acute respiratory failure, congestive heart failure, and renal failure likely due to the damaging effects from Babesia microti. And then this concludes the symptoms of Babesiosis. All right, now that you are experts at the symptoms and clinical manifestations of Lyme, anaplasmosis, and Babesiosis, let's do a quick assessment question. Um, which of the following is a hallmark sign for Lyme disease? You've got A, fever, B, hemolytic anemia, C, leukopenia, D, urethema migraines, or E, thrombocytopenia. And you are all nailing it today because the answer is D. Um, a is wrong because that's a common symptom for um, all tick-borne illnesses. And then B is wrong because that is a common symptom of babesiosis. C is wrong because that's a common symptom of anaplasmosis. And E is wrong because thrombocytopenia is seen in both babesiosis and anaplasmosis. All right, following that question, I've got a fun one just for funsies. Uh, which rash is most characteristic for Lyme disease? We've got A, B, C, or D.
All right. I see B's in the chat, and that is the right answer um, because it's got that classic target look. The um, A and C are both wrong because those are pictures of a poison ivy rash, which are raised little bumps. And then D is wrong because that's a picture of Fez from that 70s show where he gave himself a hickey. Okay, moving on. Now let's pause for a moment to grasp all the things you learned so far um, in your summary table. So let's revisit this. This is currently what you know about Lyme, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. Um, it's time we add on a little bit more. So now we have here unique clinical manifestations. For Lyme disease, the most common side, side effects are urethema migraines, muscle aches, joint aches, and then um, we've got anaplasmosis as thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, elevated ferritin, and babesiosis as thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. All right, now we make our way to objective number two, which is to define diagnostic criteria for tick-borne illnesses and objective tools for diagnosis. So diagnosis is achieved with the following, evidence or suspicion with a tick bite. It is vital to obtain a history to know of any recent travel, specifically if a patient has traveled to the Midwest or Northeastern part of the US. Another consideration for diagnosis is the clinical manifestation with suspicion for tick-borne illnesses. Think about the hallmark symptoms we talked about. Urethema migraines is um, with Lyme disease, and then we've got hemolytic anemia with babesiosis and leukopenia with anaplasmosis. Sometimes when there, um, when there is a presence of any of the hallmark symptoms, there may be no need for, for serologies, as sometimes though that's enough. For example, for Lyme disease, if there was a rash uh, showed um, that looked exactly like urethema migraines, that may be enough for diagnosis. But common practice is to continue with serologies to continue for diagnosis. We've also got speciation by PCR to confirm species and assist in differential diagnosis. Also have blood smear, uh, which is specific to babesiosis and anaplasmosis. And then we've got serologic testing to confirm diagnosis of acute or chronic infection utilizing IgM or IgG antibody detection. We will now dive into how to use PCR, blood smear, and serologic testing for diagnosis. So let's start with PCR, also known as polymerase chain reaction test. This is the test to detect genetic material from a specific organism. It can detect a specified bacterial or viral organism. Let's dive deeper into how we can use PCR testing for tick-borne illness. PCR will detect DNA of your choice using, um, choice using PCR or polymerase chain reaction to detect an acute disease infection, which is defined as a known infection within 14 days. This can be used when you have symptoms from a disease that has not gotten better with antibiotic treatment, or when we suspect it is a specified tick-borne illness. PCR testing is best used to detect DNA from skin biopsies, such as rashes, synovial fluid, um, or biopsies from arthritic joints. We do not typically use PCR testing in cerebral spinal fluid. However, it is possible to be done. PCR should always be performed with serologic tests, such as immunoassays and immunoblots, following the test. This is due to the PCR being sensitive for other types of bacterial DNA. They are specific to the species, uh, to the genus, but not the species. So, for example, for Borrelia um, in Lyme disease, it would detect for Borrelia, but not Borrelia burgdorferi. It would detect for Borrelia and along with all the different species um, that are a lot under Borrelia. And unfortunately, the PCR will not be able to differentiate the species for us. Overall, PCR is not performed as much as the clinical use of P uh, PCR may detect, uh, as the clinical use of PCR may detect a broad variety of different species. Um, it is great at detecting the genus, but again, not very good at specifying if it's Borrelia burgdorferi or if it's another Borrelia. Now that we know what a PCR is, how do we help providers order it? Here's an example uh, utilizing Lyme disease on what to order on HealthLink. The specimen can vary from 
blood, cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, hair, skin, and nails, um, and many more. The testing site is a send out lab to ARAB lab with a turnaround time of one to four days. And it's typically performed on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. However, for anaplasma, you are unfortunately unable to order this through HealthLink. You must order the lab through ARAB labs by looking it up on the lab test directory. Here's how the order looks for anaplasmosis. The specimen is blood um, and it takes about one to three days to be completed. And this test is performed seven days a week. The unique aspect of anaplasma or anaplasmosis is that it also detects for Ehrlichia, which is also a genus closely related to anaplasma. And then for babesiosis, it's gonna be similar to anaplasma. You will have to order this through ARAP and the lab directory. This panel also has the same turnaround time as anaplasmosis. Luckily, ARAP does, not, does also have a tick-borne disease panel by PCR, which will detect for babesiosis or anaplasmosis DNA in one test. This panel also has the same turnaround time in anaplasmosis and babesiosis. All PCR tests must be followed with serologies for definitive diagnosis. This is due to low levels of antibodies against tick-borne diseases. Your body may not have made enough antibodies, and also it may not be able to uh, differentiate between the different um, species of the bug of interest. You may also retest in 7 to 14 days if it is still suspicious for any tick-borne illnesses. Now let's switch gears quickly and talk about the blood smear for diagnosis. Blood smear is specific to only anaplasmosis and babesiosis. For anaplasmosis, obtaining a blood smear will look specifically for microcolonies. These microcolonies are located within the neutrophil. The arrows help guide you to where the microcolonies are located. This blood smear displays a typical characteristic of anaplasmosis in the bloodstream, highly indicating it is likely an anaplasmosis infection. For babesiosis, Obtaining a blood smear will likely look like this, and it will look specifically for parasites that are infecting the red blood cells. To orient you, you are looking at a red blood cell. The purple butterfly form are two different parasites in the cell, um, also known as the trophozyte form of, the, of Babesia, which is known as the pathogenic form. This shows you a typical blood smear uh, characteristics of babesiosis in the bloodstream, highly indicating it is likely a babesiosis infection. You cannot use a blood smear for Lyme disease, however. Lastly, switching gears one more time, let's talk about immunoassays and how to interpret them. So sero serology testing will detect antibodies circulating in your body. Sometimes it may take several weeks for the antibodies to develop after initial infection. Let's do a quick review of IgM and IgG because this is vital for understanding the immunoassay serologies. When first infected, the body makes IgM antibodies to help you fight infections. It may take up to 14 days to have the IgM reach a detectable level. As time goes on, we build antibodies called IgG, which are made to last longer to protect you against the tick-borne illness. You can see here in the graph that it takes up to 21 to 28 days for IgG to be detectable, making it likely that we will see IgM before IgG antibodies. We will test for both IgM and IgG initially, then break it down to better understand the current course of infection. And then let's um, clarify and make sure we understand what an immunoassay is. Immuno means antigen antibody reaction assay means determination of the amount in a mixture. So an immunoassay is a biochemical test that measures a specific macromolecule or small molecule using antibodies or antigen. This is used to recognize peptides or proteins made from the specific bug of interest. There are three main steps to the immunoassay. The antigen will bind to the surface, Antibodies will be bound with the target enzyme and bind to the antigen forming a conjugate. And then a substrate is introduced into the medium to create a substrate enzyme interaction, causing a change in color to detect if the pathogen is present. 
Now that we know what an immunoassay is, how do we help orders pro order providers order it? Here shows you how to order the Lyme disease immunoassays on HealthLink. The preferred specimen is blood. This test is performed by UW Hospital with a turnaround time of one day. Note that the positive antibodies will automatically trigger for Lyme IgG and Lyme IgM immunoblots to further differentiate be between acute versus chronic infection. Anaplasmosis, again, cannot be ordered through HealthLink. You must order this through the lab, through AREP lab, and utilizing their lab test directory. The specimen collected is blood, and the testing site is the AREP lab with a turnaround time of one to five days. This test is performed on Tuesdays and Fridays. Lastly, for babesiosis, you will also have to go through AREP to order the PCR. This panel also has a similar turnaround time as anaplasmosis, except it is performed on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So now that you know we can order the immunoassays, what do we do with the results? There are two different ways to interpret immunoassay results. Here are the two ways. We've got the standard and modified two-tier testing. However, UW practices the standard two-tier testing, so I'll dive deeper into how this works. First, we start off with doing the immunoassays on our bug of interest, and this is measuring if there is any IgM or IgG in the detectable. Then we um, consider if the results are positive or negative. Starting with the negative results, um, if the first immunoassays are negative, this is likely not a tick-borne disease and no additional testing is needed. However, if one or both are positive, then we consider two things. First, we consider if the signs or symptoms developed were less than 30 days. And if they were less than 30 days, then we perform IgM and IgG immunoblots. If it's been over 30 days, then we perform only IgG um, pathogen immunoblots, just because this is likely because IgG will likely be at a detectable level for diagnosis for chronic infection. And then here is the diagram for your reference. But now you're probably wondering, what is an immunoblot? I talked about immunoassays, but what makes an immunoassay different from an immunoblot? An immunoblot, quickly, is a Western blot. It is a quick and sensitive assay to detect and characterize proteins by antigen and antibody reaction. They separate proteins, glycoproteins, and other um, lipopolysaccharides by gel electrophoresis for pathogen recognition. This is a great test for tick-borne illnesses as it is highly sensitive where it can detect um, antigen levels as small as one nanogram. So how do we interpret these immunoblot results? So if um, for under 30 days from exposure, if IgM and IgG immunoblots are both negative, it is likely no evidence of infection. However, if it is uh, positive, if IgM is positive and IgG is negative, then there was likely an acute or recent infection. Note that the results of this immunoblot may have IgG become detectable at a, at a later time. So you may consider retesting at seven to 14 days to check for IgG seroconversion to also continue to confirm diagnosis. And then if IgM is negative, but IgG is positive, then there's been recent or remote infection. The reason why this is re recent or remote is that we don't know how long a patient has been exposed to that specific pathogen. So beyond the use of this clinical interpretation, we should not be using immunoblots from here on to monitor for responsive therapy. This is because patients may continue to, to display IgG positive immunoblots for years and years beyond infection. Lastly, if someone is IgM and IgG positive, it again is a recent or remote infection. This does not tell us um, if this does not tell specify if this is an acute or a chronic infection or both. Um, but know that there has been in sort of some sort of infection. Again, we don't want to use this to monitor for efficacy of therapy. All right, and then if it's been 30 days from exposure or more than 30 days, then IgM is not indicated for any um, anyone over 30 days from exposure. If IgG results as negative, 
and there's no evidence of infection and treatment is not necessary. But if, I, if IgG becomes positive, then there's likely a recent or remote infection. And again, do not use immunoblots to monitor for efficacy of therapy. All right, that was a lot of information. Um, let's practice with a lab interpretation to make sure we're understanding this um, information. I'm gonna use Lyme as an example. So imagine a patient comes in and you're reading their Lyme immunoassays are positive. So then now we perform immunoblots for this patient. And um, for IgM, their immunoblot was positive. And then for IgG, their immunoblot was negative. Which of the following is the best interpretation of these Lyme disease labs? We've got no evidence of Lyme disease, acute or recent infection of Lyme disease, or recent or remote infection of Lyme disease. You're all nailing it today. The answer is B, acute or recent infection of Lyme disease. Great job. All right, moving on to the last objective for the day. Um, I want to discuss the treatment options for the most common tick-borne illnesses in the Midwest. So let's start with empiric antibiotic therapy. And the empiric antibiotic therapy option is doxycycline. To review doxycycline briefly, it is a bacterial static antibiotic the pharmaceutical class is it's a tetracycline derivative. The mechanism of action is it stops the growth of bacteria, specifically by binding to the 30S prokaryotic ribosomal unit during pre protein synthesis. For antibiotic coverage, it is a broad spectrum um, antibiotic, which covers gram positive and gram negative bugs. It is also effective in treating other tick-borne um, illnesses or diseases such as ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, tularemia, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, some of those which we won't unfortunately talk about today. So we'll dive deeper into some primary literature to, available to support the use of doxycycline. Um, first here, we've got a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of treatment with a single 200 milligram dose of doxycycline compared to placebo. The study was completed on 482 patients who removed a deer tick from their body within the past 72 hours. The results of this showed that the efficacy treatment with doxycycline was 87% effective at reducing the risk of disease progression. In Lyme disease, if urethema migraines develop, it was significantly smaller in the doxycycline group compared to the placebo group. However, side effects are more reported in the doxycycline group. The most common side effects were nausea, and vomiting. Overall, this to summarize this, this supports giving a dose of doxycycline within 72 hours of a tick bite. It was proven to prevent the development of tick-borne disease progression. And then doxycycline is an effective medication at prevention of disease progression. So do we, when do we consider giving this to our patients? We consider initiating doxycycline in patients um, where doxycycline is not contraindicated. The attached tick is likely a deer tick based on known exposure and or tick identification. Tick was estimated to uh, be attached for longer than 36 hours and beyond if the 36 hours because this is the amount of time it takes for the pathogen to be transmitted from the tick to you. And the ticks with the pathogen carrying bugs were common in the area where the tick bite occurred. And then when suspecting um, other tick-borne illnesses, such as tularemia, spot, rocky spot and spotted mountain fever, and then Lyme disease, or really any other ones that you're concerned of. So overall, doxycycline is your first line agent when it comes to tick-borne illnesses. Now let's talk about how to treat Lyme disease. We'll talk about the primary agents utilized along with some alternative agents available. So doxycycline, talked about that enough, remains as a preferred agent for Lyme disease. You will see here the dose and recommended duration of therapy per the, per the IDSA guidelines. 
You will also see alternative agents available if doxycycline is contraindicated. We have here amoxicillin and safiroxime. Both agents are available and known to have efficacy in treatment of Lyme disease. So interestingly, in 2021, there was a meta-analysis looking at the efficacy and safety of oral and injectable antibiotics uh, for Lyme disease. There are 31 um, randomized controlled trials included in two, over 2,000 patients and 11 different antibiotics were used. For the results, you can see here um, a chart. It lists as um, on the top are the preferred agents and then the bottom are the least preferred. It showed that oral moxicillin, azithromycin, and ceftriaxone and cefotaxime were more effective for treating Lyme disease. However, on the right side, the chart is showing here that the efficacy for uh, is the efficacy for treating urethema migrans. And in this meta-analysis found that amoxicillin was more effective at treating urethema migrans than other agents available. Doxycycline did not have significant evidence to prove that it was better um, than the other agents here. So what does this mean? Alternative agents may have great efficacy activity in treatment of Lyme disease and treatment of urethema migrans, but this study is not saying that doxycycline does not work. It's not an absolute failure, but it still works. So we wanna realize that doxycycline has been used for many, many years, and it still remains as a first line uh, treatment therapy to this day. And here are some details from the different Lyme disease treatments for your reference. You will have here the pharmaceutical class, mechanism of action, PKPD, and side effects. Note that doxycycline side effects may vary depending on the different formulations available. And as pharmacists, here are some consulting points to remind you. We've got for doxycycline, it can cause an upset stomach, so make sure you take it with food. It can also cause discoloration of your skin and or teeth but has been found to really, the newer studies have shown that there's really a low risk for this discoloration, still remains as something to consider. And then also to remind patients to use sunscreen to limit sun exposure to prevent phototoxicity. For amoxicillin, make sure to take, remind patients to take it with food to help with the upset stomach. Lastly, the biggest key to any antibiotics is to complete the full duration of therapy, even if they start to feel better. And then for some monitoring parameters, when do we expect um, the symptoms to improve? We've got symptom improvement typically occurs within two to four weeks. If left untreated, it may develop into Lyme carditis, which can result in um, AV blocking or atrioventricular blocking. It can develop into neurologic Lyme disease, resulting in Lyme meningitis or Lyme arthritis. Um, Want to make sure we do not monitor for bacterial clearance or for what serologies. Again, patients may display IgG results for many years beyond this. So after treatments, patients may have symptoms that do not go away and last um, a while, which is called the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So what exactly is post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? In some cases, patients will have symptoms that last for more than six months, such as pain, fatigue, or difficulty thinking. This is likely due to an autoimmune response causing symptoms that last longer when the infection is gone. In rare cases, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome may also exacerbate other infections such as Campylobacter, Chlamydia, and Strep throat. But let's talk about the common symptoms you will see. We've got um, in 2018, John Hopkins surveyed 61 patients who have post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, and 50% of those patients reported fatigue, 28% reported severe pain, and 23% reported severe cognitive complaints, and 31% reported severe sleep difficulty. Unfortunately, there's no recommended treatment at the moment. Uh, we just recommend to continue with supportive cares, and uh, um, patients will typically get better with time. All right, let's go ahead and talk about anaplasmosis treatment. In 2003, they looked at an antibiotic susceptibilities of anaplasma phagocytophilum, comparing various antibiotics for treatment, including doxycycline and rifampin. So the results showed that doxycycline and rifampin were the most active and susceptible to anaplasma phagocytophilum. However, caution should be used with 
rifampin, as rifampin was found to have resistance to anaplasma. And they did compare uh, these two agents with uh, fluoroquinolones, such as levofloxacin um, and macrolides too, and found that um, overall levofloxacin was more preferred over um, macrolides too. But the mainstay or the recommended primary treatment options still remain as doxycycline or rifampin. And then here are the same details of each medication um, for you to reference um, for doxycycline or rifampin. Note that doxycycline still remains as the first line therapy for anaplasmosis. So now that we know how to treat it, how long will it take for us to see improvement? Symptoms will typically improve within 48, uh, within 24 to 48 hours. However, patients may have an extended duration of therapy up to 21 days, depending on their clinical symptom improvement and or other risk factors such as immunosuppression. And then some consulting points for um, anaplasmosis treatment. The consulting points for doxycycline remain the same. For rifampin, it's important to remind patients to take the medication um, one hour before eating or at least two hours after a meal. And then rifampin is also a nice red, bright red tablet, which can cause discoloration of the skin and or teeth. And then always, always, always remind patients to take it for the full duration of therapy, even if they start to feel better. So this closes up anaplasmosis treatment because we've got one more to talk about, which is babesiosis. Pay attention because babesiosis treatment is completely different than the other two. Doxycycline is not their preferred agent. So babesiosis, to remind you, is a protozoal parasitic pathogen. It is not your typical bacteria, making it more difficult to treat. Your options include atovaquone, azithromycin, clindamycin, and quinine. All of the medications are highlighted here with their recommended dosing and duration of therapy. And then again, note that the duration of therapy for this may be extended up to six weeks for patients who are immunocompromised. And then now out of all the four medications, which ones are preferred and how do we take it? It must be taken in a combination as atovacone with azithromycin or clindamycin plus quinine. Atovacone plus azithromycin is the preferred regimen for babesiosis treatment. In 2017, there was a retrospective chart review to analyze efficacy of azithromycin and atovacone. 62 patients were enrolled um, and were, had babesiosis um, treated on the clinic side, and then 40 of them were in hospitalized. Those patients were treated with azithromycin and atovacone and found that 98% of them improved and were discharged from the hospital or clinic. This proves that atovacone with azithromycin is efficacious in treating babesiosis. You may also utilize triple therapy for patients that are at, with uh, severe disease, such as atovacone plus azithromycin plus clindamycin. And then again, here are the details to each medication, um, highlighting azithromycin and atovacone specifically. Note that atovacone is utilized due to the antiprotozoal effects Babesia, Babesia microti is a protozoan pathogen, making it vital to have atovacone on board. Now that we know how to treat it, how long do we, does it take for us to see improvement? Improvement is typically seen within 48 hours of therapy, and then full resolution um, may not be likely seen until three months. There have been no prospective trials to compare the efficacy of antimicrobials in patients with severe babesiosis, and severe babesiosis is typically when a patient um, has end um, organ damage requiring um, admission to the ICU um, with life support or other um, severe cases. And then again, to reiterate, azithromycin plus atovacone are the preferred, is the preferred regimen for treating babesiosis. Do not treat babesiosis with doxycycline. Lastly, here are the consulting points to babesiosis treatment. Atovacone um, is we recommend you to shake before use as it is a fun yellow suspension and then take with food to help with preventing an upset stomach. Azithromycin to remind patients to take it between, uh, space it from two hours before or two hours after any calcium or magnesium containing products and take with food. And then don't forget to remind patients to complete the full duration of therapy. And then this concludes the treatment for babesiosis. All right, that was a lot of information covered in the past few minutes. 
let's recap with um, a patient case. So Barney Stinson is a 31 year old male. He presents to your emergency department with fatigue, fever, severe joint pain, a circular rash on his left thigh and neck pain. He thinks he has COVID, so he uh, is here to be seen. You review his past medical history. He's got hypertension, atrial fibrillation, CAD, STEMI in 2004. There are no known drug allergies and he did not have COVID. When you interview him, um, he states he's a native New Yorker who traveled to Wisconsin for a legend, wait for it, dairy or legendary hunting trip. So which of the following is the most appropriate medication to initiate for Barney Stinson? You are all nailing it today. And yes, Julia, he had a uh, STEMI when he was 16. <laughs> um, yes, the answer is a doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day. And then um, the key point to this was that circular rash, which is likely Lyme disease and doxycycline is a first line um, therapy. All right, let's summarize the treatment plans for now. Um, or the treatment plan utilizing your handy dandy summary table from before. We're now adding in treatment. So for Lyme disease, we've got doxycycline as your preferred agent and then amoxicillin and cefiroxime. Anaplasmosis, you've got doxycycline and rifampin. And then for babesiosis, you've got atovacone plus azithromycin. And then this will complete our summary table for today. Before you all leave, I wanna just uh, conclude with prevention and what to do to protect ourselves from tick-borne illnesses. First, use Environmental Protection Agency or insect repellent. Treat your clothing with 0.5% of permethrin. Avoid contact with ticks. So stay on walking trails, avoid tall grass or bushy areas. And then examine your clothing, gear, and pets for ticks. Make sure you check all those crevices, the armpits, ears, belly button, back of knees, waist, hair between the legs. You wanna really check for those crevices. That's where they like to hide. And then aim to shower within two hours after being in a tick-borne um, area, um, just so you can wash off any unattached ticks. And another important part of ticks is to know how to remove them safely. So be sure to use a clean, fine tip tweezer Grab it as close as possible to the skin and pull them straight upwards. Do not twist or jerk the tick because that can cause the mouth parts to break off and remain in the skin. And then afterwards, remove the tick, thoroughly clean and the bite area with alcohol and or soap and water. And dispose the tick by putting them in alcohol or placing in a sealed bag or container, wrapping it tightly in tape or flushing them down the toilet. Do not try to crush the tick as they have an extremely hard exoshell. And then here is my summary slide of the whole presentation. We've got tick-borne illnesses, each have specific side effect profiles, specific to each tick-borne disease and can exacerbate serious complications if left un untreated. This is why first-line therapy is doxycycline and is known to reduce the severity of tick-borne illnesses um, to reduce the, the development of serious side effects. Only exception is in babesiosis. Serologies are performed in a two-tiered phase and should not be used to monitor patients for antibiotic therapy. It is important to complete the course of therapy and provide supportive measures to manage the tick-borne disease. All right, you all powered through. So thank you for um, having me today and listening in. Um, here is your CE code, it's VITEME. Um, so don't forget to sign in, but what questions do you have? And then Julia, you had a question on anaplasmosis or ehrlichia PCR. Does it tell you which it is or will it just be positive for both? Does it matter? 
and are both treated the same? That's a good question. Um, when I looked into it, it sounded like Ehrlichia um, was, was like renamed as anaplasma. They're just like very closely related. Um, and they are treated, um, from what I could tell, the same. I didn't look at the alternative options, but doxycycline still remained as like the um, treatment preferred treatment option. They may have different, essentially, um, like alternative agents, but I didn't dive into the alternatives as much. Good question. All right, I know I want to be conscious about everyone's time. So thank you so much for having me. I hope you had as much fun as I did talking about tick-borne illnesses. Um, but uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to email me. I'm always down to answer any questions and also learn more from you all too. Take care.